Martin Shkreli wanted to be seriously rich. He had his first taste, aged just 17, when he interned at the hedge fund of CNBC host Jim Cramer. One of his stock tips, betting against a biotech company, made millions for the fund. But Shkreli wanted to make millions for himself. So at 23, he started his own fund, again betting against biotech. And then he set up another. But then he complained that there wasn't enough money in hedge funds. So he transformed himself from an anti-biotech speculator into a biotech CEO. His company, Turing Pharmaceuticals, was named after Alan Turing who famously cracked Germany's Enigma code in the Second World War. But while Turing the scientist was driven by innovation, Turing the company didn't care for innovation at all. Its strategy was to buy existing drugs and hike up their prices. It acquired Daraprim, which treated AIDS patients, the elderly, and pregnant women. And the very next day, Shkreli increased the price of a single pill from $13.50 to $750, a 5,500% increase. Shkreli had the pie-splitting mindset. The pie is the value a company creates, which is divided between profits to investors and value to society. And Shkreli viewed the pie as fixed. And then the only way to increase profits is to take from society. Shkreli took from customers by charging as much as he could. Other companies take from employees by paying them as little as possible and working them to the bone. And others still take from the environment through pollution, deforestation, and global warming. All these companies view the pie as something to be split. So, what do we do about it? Well, the obvious answer is to take back control of the pie and split it the other way. If we heavily regulate business, it can't make too much money, so there's more for the rest of us. But that doesn't work either, because profits play a key role in society. They go to investors, parents saving for their children's education, pension funds saving for retirement, and the endowments of universities hospitals, and charities. So any repurposing of business absolutely needs to take profit seriously. We can't have this endless fight between them and us, where everybody squabbles over a fixed pie. What we need is another way. In 2003, the telecoms company Vodafone noticed that Kenyan citizens were using their phones to transfer mobile minutes to each other as a form of currency. This sparked an idea. What if we could develop a technology that would allow people to transfer not mobile minutes, but actual money? At the time, 15 million Kenyan adults were unbanked. They had to rely on cash, which could be forged or lost or stolen. So if Vodafone could pull it off, the social impact would be huge. After four years of hard work, Vodafone launched m a mobile money service that transformed people's lives. Within the first seven years, it lifted 200,000 households out of poverty by giving them access to finance. And many of these households were headed up by women. It allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail, so there was a large effect on gender equality. Now, Vodafone launched m to solve a social problem, not to make money. But after the fact, Vodafone found a way to monetize it so investors benefited as well, even though profits were never the primary objective. m represents this other way, the pie-growing mindset. By creating value for society, A company is not sacrificing profits, it's growing the pie, ultimately enhancing profits. So serving society doesn't just have a moral and ethical case, it has a business and financial case. Convinced? Well, you shouldn't be, at least not yet. 
Because Vodafone is only a single story. Perhaps for most companies, serving society is at the expense of profit. And I've just handpicked the one company in which they are aligned. So my job as a business school professor is not to tell stories, it's not even to write case studies, but it's to analyze hundreds of companies across dozens of industries over multiple years. So I wanted to see whether companies that create value for society actually become more successful. So I looked at the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. These are companies that go above and beyond in how they treat their employees. My initial analysis spanned 28 years. Then Professor Hamid Bustanifer and Young Day Khan extended it by another nine. Collectively, we found that these best companies to work for delivered shareholder returns that beat their peers by 2 to 2.7% per year over a 37-year period. That is 213 to 265% compounded. And I did further tests to address the concern that maybe there's reverse causality. Once a company is already performing well, then it can start spending on its employees. And also confounding variables, maybe the tech industry both has happy employees and also strong financial performance. Convinced? Well, you still shouldn't be. At least, not yet. Even if you believe all of our data, does it really support the pie-growing mindset? Perhaps a company doesn't need to think about social value. It only needs to think about profit. A profit-focused company should know that if I treat my employees well, they'll be more productive and I'm going to make more money. Indeed, for over 100 years, finance professors like me have stressed how a company should make decisions by estimating the impact on profits. So if I'm considering an electric car factory, I can estimate how many cars will it make, how much can I sell them for, and if the revenues exceed the costs, I can go ahead. I don't need to care about climate change. I only need to care about profit. And I will build that electric car factory because there's money to be made. But many decisions can't be reduced to a financial calculation. Back in 2003, Vodafone's strategy was to win Spectrum license auctions and expand in the West because that's where there was the biggest market. And Pesa would have never been justified with a spreadsheet. The tech challenges were huge. And even if Vodafone could make it work, there was no profit to be made in serving some of the poorest people in the world. But the power of the pie-growing mindset is it frees us from having to motivate every decision with a financial calculation. Instead, the motivation is to build a better world. And that spurs us to create, to discover, to explore, to come up with ideas that ultimately end up profitable, but we could have never predicted the profit from the outset. Because it's hard to forecast more than several years out, and because profits often come from sources that we never expected. What is the evidence that profits might be unanticipated? Professor Caroline Flammer studied shareholder proposals to make a company more responsible. That's when shareholders go to an annual general meeting and propose a vote, perhaps to implement an anti-discrimination policy or to reduce carbon emissions. And Caroline found that after these votes are passed, sales, profits, and the stock price all go up. Now, these proposals aim to create value for society. They didn't aim to make money. Yet by growing the pie, profits ultimately were increased anyway. And just think about that for a moment. Right? These proposals should not be needed if the profit mindset is enough. Any CEO should know that anti-discrimination is good for profits because it's going to boost morale. So they should have put these policies in place anyway. But they didn't. It took the diverse perspectives of outside investors, one step removed from the day-to-day -day focus on profits, to open their eyes. 
So how do we put this pie-growing mindset into practice? By being guided by purpose. Nowadays, everybody is talking about purpose, from the CEO of BlackRock, the largest investor in the world, to Princeton from Avenue Q. But everybody talks about purpose without really defining what it actually is. So what exactly is purpose? I define it as why a company exists, who it serves, its reason for being, and the role it plays in the world. Now, that sounds pretty lofty, so let me pick it apart. The first key point is that purpose is about service. A purpose cannot be to make profit. Profits are important, but profits are the result of serving society. They are not the end goal. Vodafone's purpose is to build a digital society that enhances socioeconomic progress. And if they succeed in doing that, then they will be more profitable. The second point is that purpose has to be focused. Why you exist, who you serve, your reason for being, and the role you play, they all are specific. If we go back to Princeton's dilemma, a person's purpose could never be to be a doctor and a teacher and an entrepreneur you'll choose to focus on one of those things. And the same is true for companies. The United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals, but it's not a company's responsibility to solve every single one of the world's problems, but to focus on the three or four where it can really move the needle. So how do we decide this focus? By asking ourselves, what is in my hand? What are the resources and what is the expertise that my company has? And how can I use them to serve society if I just think a little bit more creatively? Vodafone realized that it could take its expertise in transferring text messages and leverage that to transfer money. So that's why they tackled financial inclusion rather than one of the world's many other challenges. Now, the power of viewing purpose as using your expertise is it allows all companies to play their part, large and small. We often think about purpose as spending money to split the pie the other way, to donate millions to charity or to give free products to customers. But smaller companies just don't have pie to give. But they can ask, what is in my hand? Take Barry's, the boutique fitness studio. There's a branch 10 minutes walk away from here. They were closed in the pandemic. But what is in their hand is fitness expertise, which they used to offer free Instagram fitness classes, which made a huge difference when we were all locked down at home. Now, you might think a fitness company doesn't need a special mindset to come up with free fitness classes. But what about the reception desk workers? The gyms were closed, so there was no desk work, so how could they help out? Well, many of these desk workers are actors as their main career. And if you're an actor, what is in your hand? Well, you're really entertaining. But how does that help out? Well, in the pandemic, schools were shut, so children were at home. So Barry's offered free Zoom storytelling sessions and other online entertainment to kids to take the load off the working parents. And the power of what's in my hand is it allows all people to play their part. We often talk about purposeful companies, but companies don't make decisions. People make decisions. Now, if purpose is about splitting the pie, donating millions to charity, then only the CEO can make that decision. But if purpose is about using what's in our hand, that's something every employee can do. And importantly, we can all do that irrespective of whether our company is actually purposeful. My first job was in investment banking. I started right at the bottom in a position called analyst. I thought I had nothing in my hand. No one worked for me. But I realized people did work for me. There was my secretary, there was the IT department, and perhaps the most abused department in an investment bank is called graphics. Analysts would give them unintelligible scribbles 
and they would turn them into beautiful PowerPoint slides. But analysts often shouted at them for not doing what they wanted, even though it was our fault for not explaining it clearly enough. So when I got good work back from graphics, I call them up and say thank you. I thought nothing of it, but because I was so junior, I didn't have my own office, I sat on the open plan floor. So other analysts heard me and started saying thank you themselves. I'm not going to claim that we transformed the entire culture of this global investment bank, but on that section of the seventh floor of those offices in Canary Wharf, London, people started treating each other a little bit more kindly. We often think about ourselves as a thermometer. We reflect the temperature around us. So if the atmosphere is cutthroat, we need to be cutthroat ourselves to survive. But everybody, from CEO to analyst, has the power to be a thermostat and affect the temperature around us. The pie-growing mindset inspires us to think about what is in our hands and use it to serve society, to solve global problems like financial inclusion and local problems like making our colleagues feel that little bit more appreciated. It doesn't need to cost a ton of money. It doesn't need you to be the CEO. All it needs is a mindset shift. Ask not, how much money can I make? Ask, how much value? can I create? Thank you very much.